and welcome to APG's Energy Insights. I'm Vern Stefanik, and this is another podcast from AAPG in our ongoing series, Digging Deeper, featuring conversations with the speakers for this year's AAPG, AAPG Foundation's Distinguished Lecture Series. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Perch, an associate professor in the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Incidentally, Michael's DL lecture, which is available for either downloading or streaming on the APG website, is titled Data Analytics and Machine Learning for Energy Geoscience and Engineering. Talk about timely, right? And today we get to know a little more about Michael, his journey from rural Canada to the corporate world of energy, to the position he holds today which continues to be both connected to and also impacting and influencing the energy industry. And we'll talk about machine learning. Michael, welcome to Digging Deeper. We're glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, uh, and so your talk, as I, said, as I just mentioned, is about machine learning. And let's get right into it because uh, you have kind of a uh, what, what we've found to be a, a pretty cool life, a pretty cool journey in your life, where you started out, uh, how you went through the industry, um, and now uh, with at an academic institution, but still talk, talking to industry. And a lot of what you talk about, though, deals with machine learning, which you are have sort of been part of for many years, but it wasn't really called machine learning. Is that right? So clearly it's a case of we're all learning together right now. Okay. There's um, a wave of the technology going through, but the way I see it is machine learning is statistical learning. And we have been working with big data. We've been working with statistical models of the subsurface, combining multiple sources of information, working with uncertainty, and putting that all together for the purpose of inference and prediction the whole time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so for me, it's very natural for us to make the extension into what would be more properly known as machine learning nowadays. Okay. So um, yeah, I would say, um, I think I've been working in that area for a while and I think many of us have been working in data analytics and statistical learning. So how come everybody's scared to death? Not everybody, but a lot of people. You know, you hear about, they, there's an intimidation factor about the concept yeah. of machine learning. Yeah. What's going on? So I think um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the uh, technology. Now, I think it can be, it's interesting, there's a whole continuum. It can either be quite incremental in the form of automation of some of our common tasks, and in some cases, it may be disruptive or transformative. I like to say transformative and be more positive about it. But no matter how I see it, I think there's great opportunities to see new value, to be able to uh, make our jobs more focused. Uh, geoscientists will spend more time doing geoscience. That's how I see it. We'll spend less time um, clicking in our interpretations. We'll have more guidance. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes our interpretations are very challenged by all of the different types of data that we try to integrate. Mm -hmm. And what we'll find is that these new tools will help us avoid contradictions. I've seen that before working on subsurface asset teams where um, I don't think everybody quite agrees around the table. Mm -hmm. And then it's not till you build the model that you see there's contradictions in the concepts, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So in, in talking, in, in giving uh, all of us an idea of the scope or the magnitude of what's going on with machine learning, is this something that industry-wide everybody's trying to pick up on right now? Or is it just a couple of people are saying, we're ahead of the curve? I don't know. Definitely different companies are at different positions as far as readiness in this digital revolution. That's for sure. But um, I, just last year alone, I think I visited and taught within about 20 different companies. Uh, I do still teach my courses in case the chair is watching this video, right? <laughs> now, um, but I'll tell you what, every single company I go to, they're facing the challenge and they're trying to do something right now around digital technologies, data analytics and machine learning. And I've seen a whole range of responses. I've seen a lot of companies who are, we have a couple of people, maybe they've hired a couple of data scientists, we're trying to fast follow or try to understand what's going on. I've seen other companies that say, we wanna be at the lead. Mm -hmm. um, there's one company, ConocoPhillips, they have a huge effort to teach hundreds of engineers and geoscientists to make them citizen data scientists which is an amazing effort, amazing program. And I've seen a whole range in between there of different efforts around this. I have seen, as far as adding value, um, a lot more focus on the data. 
And to be honest, to be honest, like um, you know, we have P10 and P90. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, the P10 or the low side outcome, a Chevron P10, would be uh, we just do better with data. We do better with understanding statistics, right. and more people understand how to do basic coding and scripting so they can automate and be more efficient in what they do. I think that, to me, that that might be where we see much of our value. So. What is the the uh, the the state of the art of data right now that the industry is using? So it's a very good question. I, I when I go from company to company, I see similar types of challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, data storage and curation is a huge challenge. Um, what I'm seeing is a lot of data sets for which um, oh, there is a combinatorial of versions because of multiple interpretations, uncertainty, data that needs to be integrated into the, um, or um, concepts have to be integrated together. And the result is um, often this is not stored in such a way that as we move through project life, which often has, as you know, cycles of many professionals working on the same project, right? People don't Uh stay on the same project, that things can fall through the cracks. Yeah. Um, And we may not fully harness what was done previously. I see there's many issues around data like that. I think when it comes to metadata, we also do struggle as an industry. How do we track, how do we keep track of all of the assumptions, all of the choices that went into formulating that data? Many of the data we work with isn't really primary data, right? It's yeah, not directly right. from the measure. It required layers of interpretation yeah. on top. So I think, to be honest, um, I think about a decade ago, I saw a lot of companies go through a revolution saying, we're going to ramp up and have this great universal database. And they start to look at database technologies, which in itself is own scientific field. And they were looking at how do we have standards? Mm-hmm. How do we put it together? How do we get everything to talk to each other? I don't think we succeeded there. I don't think that finished for most companies. And so I think we're still going to face challenges with data as we go into data analytics. So most of the challenges now, um, we may not even know what the big challenges in interpretation are going to be mm-hmm. because we still don't have, it, it, it's garbage in, garbage out, yep. so to speak. Yep. Well, and so this is part of the reason I'm motivated to teach. And, and so I've worked to actually... Um, completely changed the curriculum for our undergrad program at University of Texas at Austin. Mm-hmm. I'm doing that in my department. I'm also helping over in the College of Natural Sciences with the Freshman Research Initiative. Mm-hmm. And I want scientists and engineers to understand statistics, programming, data analytics, and machine learning so that as they go out there, they're able to pose the questions. I had a student come in my office and they said, I've got this great idea. I'm going to take seismic information, well, well information. I'm going to do these great forecasts. And I said to them, I said, what are your predictor features? And they didn't know. They hadn't broken it down to the nuts and bolts. They didn't understand well enough to be able to pose the question in a manner that could be used by data analytics and machine learning. Actually, I want to come back to some more of your experiences in the classroom okay. and teaching. But, but getting there, the one thing that, has, uh, that, that is obvious in your, in your lecture and is apparent even from us talking here right now is that you have a, a, a passion for, for learning about things, seeing challenges and figuring out how to, how to go forward through them and, and trying to take steps forward always. You're, it seems to me like everything is advancing, advancing. Could you talk a little bit about your background? Or how, how, how did all that start? Uh, for some of us who don't know you that well, where are you from? What's going on? So um, I think I can best describe myself as a farm kid from Alberta. I came from a small town. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I was working on a farm. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent a while during high school working as a waiter at a local um, restaurant yeah. and then went into a dairy farm and realized I work with cows better than <laughs> <laughs> customers in the restaurant. I really enjoyed the cows and I really, really enjoyed the manual labor and all of that aspect of it. Okay, so I came out of that and um, from a family that actually was, um, I guess we could characterize as low income, not a lot of opportunities. I'm first generation to, I'm the first to get a university degree from the family. So it was kind of a big step. Um, I went out and just did that. Um, I was driven to do that. And what's really funny is um, I hadn't really thought about university. I had no concept of, of it. And um, it was just a random conversation with a university student that led to the whole thing. I was in grade 11. I was uh, working full time, had a girlfriend, had the car payments, had all that stuff. And I was doing terrible in high school. I wasn't very good at all. My marks were terrible. You were not a good student. I was not a great student at that point. 
So grade 11, fortunately this was Canada. I'll get back to that. Yeah. So I'm filling up my old rusty car and another person pulls up at the pump on the other side on a cold evening, dark and cold evening there in Alberta. And he starts talking to me. And this is a Canadian thing. We talk to strangers. We, we totally do. And so he looks at me, he says, do you know how that engine works? And I said, uh, what do you mean? You know, I knew something about the internal combustion engine, force cycle, whatever it is, a four stroke. And um, he said, no, he started to explain the theoretical Carnot cycle about entropy and pressure and temperature. And, and they were an engineering student working in materials engineering and talking about how they were building. Wait, you, didn't, you didn't know this person. Didn't know the person. And they drew the chart, the entropy, entropy plot, plot directly on like a windshield with frost. They were telling me these things. And it was amazing. I was just taken aback. Like I'd never really known engineers or geoscientists or scientists, and they were explaining these scientific concepts. And I looked at that and I said that night, I said, I'm going to be a scientist. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to learn this stuff. So the next day I went to high school. I made an appointment, met with the student counselor, yeah. uh, Mr. Jameson. I, you know, I've thanked him later on, don't worry. <laughs> and Mr. Jameson, he looked up my marks. He looked at me and said, Michael, high school, uh, university is not for everybody. University is not for everybody. My marks were not even close. And uh, from that moment, I cut down the hours at the restaurant. I focused and that was it. That was my mission to go into university. Well, I got accepted in engineering. Part of the drive for that was the engineering program. They had a mining engineering program. It was very geologic, yeah. but it also had co-op program. So I could work half the time. The geosciences didn't have that. Okay. So for my undergrad, unfortunately, I was forced to do mining engineering instead of geoscience, which is what I really wanted to do. And um, I graduated number one in my class. Holy I was cow. on fire. I was driven. I was just like, this is it. This is my life now. And so I went all the way through to PhD, which was much more um, geologic, um, subsurface modeling and geostatistics. Where, where, uh, where was your education? Where did you go to school? Both degrees, University of Alberta. Okay. Up in Edmonton, Alberta. So yeah. that explains that the cold, frosty evenings <laughs> in the winter. I think you could understand how bad it could be. Minus 40 is not atypical. Wait, did, okay, probably not, but I got to ask. So the the person who you had the conversation yeah, yeah. with, did you ever, who was it? Was it? So I, I, it? I know that they were a student, kind of a senior student from the University of Alberta in materials engineering, but I never found them. I thanked my guidance counselor because Mr. Jameson, he made me mad. Yeah. He made yeah. me so mad that day. I said, what do you mean it's not for me? Yeah. I can do it. And, and it was it motivated. But no, I'd love to meet that student again. But I'll tell you what, now I do the same thing. To me, the whole world is a gas station. I, I'm, I'm serious. Like, yeah. I walked out of campus, as I often do, like 8 o'clock at night because I'm so busy. And I'd forgotten to eat all day because I'm just way too busy as a professor. And I walk out and there's a student just standing at the back door in the dark there, propping the door open. And I thought, well, as a professor, I thought it was a student. I said, as a professor, I should ask. You know, what are you doing here kind of thing? You know, yeah. is there a security issue or something? The door being held open at night and all, right? Yeah. And they said, well, there was a, some type of event inside they were attending. It was a LAN party, actually. A bunch of the engineering <laughs> students had got together and ge playing LAN games or whatever. Yeah. And then I said, so I looked at them and said, are you a student here? And they said, no. And then I looked back and I introduced myself. I'm Professor Perch. You know, you're very much welcome here. Nice to see you. They introduced themselves very politely. And then I said, you should hang around here a little bit more often. We'll make you into a scientist. Or an engineer and I just thought I just thought what that meant like if it had been me in their in their shoes mm -hmm. for a professor on campus to take the time to welcome me and to speak to me like that yeah would have potentially changed my life I, I thought that way and so every time I meet with people now I, I'm, I'm funny I go to the HEB store I tell people I'm a professor because it always ends up in a conversation with a bunch of students who are working and you know yeah. hey, what are you doing where are you going to next you know yeah well, you, there's a, so there's a part of you not only that uh, wants to learn about more, but you also have the other side of wanting to give back. You want to share it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does, does that come from your family? Does that come from the Boy Scouts? What, 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 what was it? So, so it's a really good question. Um, I, grew, I think my situation growing up was pretty difficult and very mm -hmm. challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think because of those struggles, I have a high degree of um, um, sympathy. I can um, put myself in other people's shoes, I, I can imagine. And, and so I think that partly motivates me. I think, I think the professor I studied with during my PhD, Clayton Deutsch, mm -hmm. he had developed open source software for geostatistics that was used all over the world. 
It was used to develop all kinds of software packages that made, I'm sure, fortunes. And he didn't worry about it. He just freely gave things away. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from him was when you do that, it does come back. And for me, what am I concerned about? I'm concerned about um, finding funding for students, helping my students do well. You know, and so what I've done now is I give every one of my lectures away. Now, part of it is also just practical. In this modern digital age, mm -hmm. if you record your lectures and give it to students, guess what? They're going to give it away. Do you know what I mean? There's still, it's, there's internet sites where everything can, my book that I wrote with Oxford, you can get it on some site right now, right. PDF, you know. So what I realized was just give it away myself. And so I record every lecture. I record a product that's useful for professionals, useful for my students. People yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. And I get to be part of something. I get to do something great. And the result is, I'll tell you what, I go into meetings with companies and I'm like, shall we talk about what I do? And then we can talk about maybe collaboration. And they said, don't worry. We follow you on Twitter. We watch your lectures on YouTube. We know what you do. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about collaboration. Let's talk about funding students. Man. That's a dream as a professor. That's a, to me, that works perfectly. Way cool. Way cool. Let, uh, if you could fill in a blank or two before we, uh, we keep wanting to, uh, I keep wanting to get to the education uh, and, and some of the ways that you interact with students today and everything. But even before that, I to fill in a couple of blanks. So, because you were in industry for a while. Yeah. So you went, uh, you get your, your PhD. Yes. And what, what happens career-wise after that? Straight to Chevron. Straight to Chevron, working okay, in and the technology it was, company, yes. Okay, okay. What, you're doing what? what, were you, what were you so about? starting out, it was more practitioner, working on service projects, um, getting some experience doing subsurface model, modeling in the industry. Mm -hmm. now, during my PhD, I'd supported myself in my PhD by consulting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I'd okay. bun, done a bunch of consulting for a bunch of energy companies out of Calgary. And so when I was in Chevron, you I got say to, that casually, that's, that, that's pretty impressive. It was good. It was good. I, I joke. I took a pay cut when I started working with Chevron out of my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I'm, I had two kids while I was in my PhD and my wife was home with the kids and I was providing for a family while doing a PhD. It was great. It wow. worked. It was beautiful. And I was fortunate. Absolutely. I had great opportunities. Um, but when I started with Chevron, I had an opportunity to learn the Chevron way, the Chevron methods to, to just drown in amazing data sets mm -hmm. and yep. to be mentored you know you get a phd but come on you got to realize the people in the industry have been doing it for 30 years sit down and just learn what they know mm -hmm. you know what i mean so people like scott meadow uh, sebastian stromello who's my team leader morgan sullivan great, amazing mentors i got to work with henry post and Mature for a while wow just great people mitch harris like i just love these people you know <laughs> great it was, names. It, it was a great wonderful names. it was a wonderful time to be there and um so i got to learn a lot kind of grew up in that and then I found that I really liked research. Mm -hmm. And so I started to develop, I started to code, I started to learn more kind of quantitative methods, the yeah. um, data analytics, more of that. And um, it reached a point where I started to lead the team, lead the project, lead the program. It was um, several million dollars worth of research a year that I was running. Yeah. And then um, right around that, the opportunity to go back to academia appeared. I'd written a book, I'd had about 40 something peer review publications while still at Chevron, and um, academia came knocking. So, um, by the way, um, Henry and, and Mitch Harris, oh, wow, <laughs> the great, great, great people. I, uh, I love them. Industry-wise, profession-wise, APG-wise. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but through this, uh, and before we leave, so the, the, since you were doing research, I mean, that, that, that would be perfect for kind of the way you are in wanting to keep learning more and learning more and learning more, was... Um, was this in an era, and I, I know we've talked before that machine learning has always been with us, we just call it different things, yes. but is this where some of those uh, real ties and connections started for you? I think um, thinking about the world and our data sets and what were the new lenses we could use to try to explore and understand that. It was a general mission of we can quantify everything. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. kind of been my attitude the whole time. And if you think about it, that's a prerequisite for everything machine learning. Mm -hmm. You have to feed in numbers. You can't just feed in some subjective interpretation. You have to quantify mm -hmm. that. And so I think that really expanded my interest around data analytics. And then, of course, we got into basic machine learning methodologies all over the place, but we call it more statistical learning. Yeah. You know, machine learning did kind of take off just in the last couple of years. I know this is like the fourth wave of it. But as far as kind of taking off again, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so now we've kind of now at the same time, 
When I teach my machine learning course, I say something. And I say, if you take my data analytics, my geostatistics course, I can stand up here and say, I wrote the book in it. I know it. I've published you know, lots on it. I'm, I'm, I'm an expert, recognized expert. What I say in machine learning is I speak from humility. And I say, guess what? We're kind of all learning together a little bit. Because the field is moving so fast. Yeah. There's so many things. But I'll tell you what, um, understanding fundamental statistics and data analytics, you can understand in depth what's going on with machine learning generally. Okay. Yeah. When, um, was there a point in, how, how did I, I want to say this uh, politely and w without sounding <laughs> snarky, um, when you realized corporate culture wasn't for you, oh, okay. was that part of the, of the yeah. realization that you wanted to give back? So I'm kind of, I'm unusual. Is I got to tell you, um, there's many days I wake up and I still think, what did I do? Because I love industry. Yeah. I love my experience within Chevron. I, I tell my students in my classes, I say, I wish my career were upon you. Because it was, I was so fortunate. I loved my experience inside the industry. In fact, I mimic industry still. I have many students who want to study with me, not just because of the topic, because of my behaviors. I run my team in the university like I ran my team over in industry. So the same attitudes around leadership, transparency, respect, yeah, yeah. and so forth, I use that as a professor. And I think people, and you know what I think, I think if we use leadership skills as professors, won't we send out people who will be better leaders? Shouldn't we be examples of that? So anyway, so what I'm trying to say here is that I love industry. In fact, I remember the moment, so I, I interviewed. And then, of course, I went through a process just like everybody did. You know, they, you know, th there was interest in me, but I went through the fair interview system mm -hmm. and they were, I knew they were coming back with an offer. And um, I had a number on a piece of paper and that number was the minimum I could accept because, of course, there was a pay cut going to academia mm -hmm. and I could still take care of my family. That matters to me. I've got three kids. Yeah. The chair of the department said that number. And I actually probably made an audible, oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a part of me, there was a part of me that wanted them to be under. And then I would just have to be sorry. I'll just have to keep being happy in industry. <laughs> but, but no, they were right there at that number. And it was my wife who sat down with me afterwards. And I said, and I started to rationalize. I said, yeah. but no, we can't. It's a big move. It's all this. And she said, you will always regret. You'll always wonder what, what if. Yeah. And so, um, so made the choice. But so what I'm saying is there's a parallel universe in which I'm still happy in industry. Mm -hmm. And I came to academia really driven by, um, so when I was in industry, my attitude was this, accept every challenge. Yeah. And um, I did. I did a lot of interesting things because I said, I'll learn that. Yeah. Like I learned C++ to take an internship with Chevron right at the beginning. I had done nothing in C++ and within a month I could do reasonable C++, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So, so to me, this was the ultimate accept every challenge. Could I be a professor? Well, that, that just begs a question to, to jump out of sequence here, though. So what, what, what has been the biggest challenge that it just, like, you know, kicked your tail, actually? <laughs> I know. I right? Know. I know, I know. So um, I, like, um, I like the culture inside of industry. We win together. Yeah. Like, it's taken them two years to teach me that the chair is not my boss. I still believe, I feel like I'm in a hierarchical organization. I feel like everyone around me is on a team together. And my attitudes, I have 12 PhDs, six of them are co-supervised. And I'm more than happy to do that. What an honor to work with Dr. Torres Verdon and Dr. Lake and, you know, just so many great professors, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so academia, I'm not saying anything negative, yeah. just to be clear here. Right. But that same focus on team, mm -hmm. that same kind of unified, you in... Uh, you and academia will feel alone. Um, I'll tell you, I went to do some teaching at Noble Energy. And the second day of teaching, I went, I woke up that morning, I started my car and the car wouldn't start. And I realized I'm just a professor here by myself with my personal car. It doesn't start. How the heck am I going to get there? How am I going to teach? How am I going to get my car fixed while I'm teaching all day? And that's when I realized if I'd been working with Chevron, mm -hmm. there's a card in my pocket, I'd phone it, everything's taken, you know, the company's right. got your back. Yeah. You don't have that in academia. And so everything you do, you've got to be entrepreneurial. You've got to find funding. Right. And um, people don't understand one PhD on, um, without overhead is about $50,000 per year. And um, there are companies, many companies, that will kind of nickel and dime you about ten and $20,000 a year. And you're sitting there in the back of your mind realizing this is just covering a term. Mm -hmm. you, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I find that to me, those are some of the greatest challenges.
Mm. Now, are we going to ask about the positive stuff so I can end on a positive thing? Certainly. I was <laughs> what, that, it's exactly what I was wondering. Yeah. So about the positives. The positives. Um, so I, I, the days that I came home electrified on fire when I was in industry were the days that I was teaching mm -hmm. and mentoring. My life is full of that now. I have an open door policy. Students are coming in. I'm constantly mentoring and helping and assisting and teaching. I love teaching. Yeah. I, I, I really enjoy standing up in front of a classroom and just teaching. Um, I'll teach a new concept, like bootstrap is a good example. And I'll say, okay, today we're going to learn about statistical bootstrap. Who's heard of this before? Nobody puts their hands up. And I'll look out and I'll say, this is truly a great day. I get to be the one to share this with you. Oh, man. Like, I love that. That just gets me so excited because this is changing people's worlds. And I have so many students. Can I brag? Yeah. Oh, please. My rankings are really, really high. <laughs> the, the, the rankings are very high and the students love it. And, and I got so many students sending me messages of this was the best class they took. And they're so excited by it. And it, it really moves me. Oh. And to me, that just keeps me going because it doesn't matter what's difficult. When I get that, it just makes me feel so excited about what I'm doing. I feel validated about this choice. I'm curious, uh, because you do uh, teach classes in, in, in industry mm -hmm. as well as uh, the difference, uh, two things, the difference in your approach, if yep. there is a difference, yep. but also the difference in the people who you're talking to. Yep. yep. So that's a very good question. So one thing I do is, well, when I teach in industry, I do recognize the fact I don't get as much time with the people. Mm -hmm. And so I high grade a lot more. Okay. And I do tend to be much more just practical. Um, my attitude when I teach in industry is I want to teach you something in an hour or two that you can use tomorrow to show incremental value. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. Okay. And so I do a lot of that. I may cover some basic fundamentals and theory, but then I have to switch into practice pretty quickly. Right. With the students, you can evolve. You can kind of grow that over time. And I do enjoy having a, like teaching a full term as it's amazing what you can cover in a full term, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you one thing though. I am a very nice person, but when it comes to being a lecturer and control of the classroom, I'm awful. I'm really awful. I will not tolerate unprofessional anything. In other words, your cell phones are away. If you've got a laptop and I roam that classroom and it's not on the course content, mm -hmm. I'll kick you out because I have no tolerance for that because guess what? You're going to leave my classroom knowing professional behavior. And when I was a team leader, if you're sitting there on like texting someone in the middle of my meeting, yeah. it looks unprofessional. And so I use that when I teach. I have the professional kind of industry standard. And I'm finding that's not universal. Students are surprised that, oh, I can't have my cell phone out. I can't be texting someone while I'm in your class. Yeah. It amazes me. So anyway, so I kind of, it's, yeah, I take the culture from industry into my classroom. And there, and there's so much, uh, I was thinking while you were telling that story. So I, I, I taught nothing like geoscience, uh, script writing for a while at a, at a college in Tulsa. And, uh, I remember like, maybe it was five, six years ago, all of a sudden. Yeah. And at first it was really hacked off when they were, had their computers and everything. And then I realized that was their tool. They were actually using it, yeah. but they better be using it as a yeah. tool or yeah. else you get mad. So machine learning is, uh, in, in, in your analysis then, is, is, it, is it a tool or is it the magic solution to something? How should we think of it? So that's a really good question. People need to manage their expectations with the technology. So one course I really enjoyed to teach is I have a half a day course that I teach to executives in industry. Mm -hmm. It's basically, um, I'm not going to say it's buzzword compliance. But it's kind of teaching them kind of the highlights. How would they judge this technology? How should they see the technology? What are some of the terms being used? And so I really enjoy teaching that. Mm -hmm. Because um, what I do is I spend about an hour just being very critical, very negative about it, showing kind of how things can crash, how things don't work, mm -hmm. when it can be abused and misused. Now, what you find about me is I'm pretty flexible. I have a whole continuum of beliefs depending on the application. On one side, I'm quite optimistic that there's huge value and opportunities to dramatically or make a significant shift or disruption to the way that we get the job done for the subsurface and geosciences and engineering. On the other side, I'm kind of pessimistic and I see the limitations. I see how we're not going to be able to completely automate everything. Mm -hmm. And so in general, my response would be, I'm never an advocate for the geoscientist in the box. 
I don't think we ever do. I go back to the idea of these methodologies will allow us to have geoscientists spend more time doing geoscience and some of the more mundane parts of their job, their tasks will basically be automated. Their interpretations would be better supported by systems that help them semi-automate their interpretations, mm -hmm. help them put their information in, their knowledge in, at the same time, be aware of all the other potential contradictions with other information sources. Mm -hmm. So in general, that's been my perspective as far as how these technologies are going to change and move us forward. Yeah, because that the the, the deal uh, I remember in your in your lecture, you talked about uh, it's an enormously high percentage of time yeah. that we're actually worrying about the data yeah, know, itself, I right? Know, what what was it like eighty percent? Often it could be ninety percent of data preparation. Yeah, yes. right. Yes, and and so clearly there's a lot we can do to automate and improve the efficiencies of what we do, and so I think there's huge value in that. At the same time, what's very interesting, I was in a PhD defense and I was co-supervising the student with Dr. Torres Verdon. Mm -hmm. I think it was one of our co-supervised students. And I asked something about data analytics and machine learning and he stopped and he said, listen, sometimes I feel like people use it as a crutch. And there was a great quote from Dr. Torres Verdon where he said, people, instead of understanding the fundamental geoscience and engineering, will try to use data-driven approaches as a crutch. That's my fear, is that that will drive us in that direction. I don't think it should be that way. It's just, like I said during the talk, we have the first, the second, and third scientific paradigms are essential to what we do. Mm -hmm. Geoscience and engineering knowledge is essential to what we do. The fourth paradigm in data-driven approaches provide us new toolkit, and new methodologies we can use. Interpretability remains key. What I find with my students is they often jump to the most complicated models. Um, in my classes, they'll get so excited, they want to do the really complicated methodologies. They're like, look at me, I did this deep convolutional generative adversarial network, blah, 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 and I built this model, it made this prediction, it's got this R squared of variance explained of like 90 something percent. And I'll go back and I'll look at it and I'll realize that this is overfit. This is just, yeah, it's a model that has so many parameters in it and so little data to train it, you're just able to precisely honor the data. It has enough degrees of freedom to honor the data. Mm -hmm. And so this has been one of my concerns too. Now, at the same time, I am excited by the technology. I show an example in my talk where we're able to make forecasts of the intergranular velocity field, the flow of a fluid, right? That's awesome. Now, where do I think that could play a role? Multi-scale modeling. Imagine we're trying to understand how poor scale cementation diagenetic alterations affect overall recovery mechanisms at the large scale of the drainage radius of a well. Imagine if we have models that can work that fast in making those predictions across those small scales to larger scales. That would be beautiful. Because now we have the geoscientists sitting there saying, I think this is the diagenetic alterations. I think this is how the grain structure is stacked. I think this is the uncertainty range. And they can immediately see how that impacts mm. what the bottom line, which is dollars and flow, right? Right, right. Well, okay, so let me ask you this question then with, 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 with that in mind. Uh, so how, how is this going to impact the industry of the future? Yeah. Yep. So um, we had a great talk. Um, one of the vice presidents of Equinor came and visited us mm -hmm. at the department and gave an excellent talk about basically where Equinor is going. And he made a lot of statements about how this new technology can be used, how the workforce is going to change. I think there will be changes. Now, my perspective is more of an evolution rather than a revolution. Okay. Um, I was in a front of a panel for PricewaterhouseCooper, as I mentioned, and there was another individual expert there who was suggesting a massive replacement of engineers and geoscientists with data scientists. And I look at that, or they kind of are advocates of the geoscientist or the engineer in the box. Which is, which is I think, where some of the fear and intimidation yep. is coming yep. from, right? And, so. I, and I look at that, and I don't agree with that at all. Okay. I think looking forward, first of all, I look at our business and I know our business because I've worked in it for you know all these years. I know much of it and I know the complexity. I know I have a respect for the scientific disciplines. I've sat and listened to Professor Pemberton talk about ichnophases. I've listened to Henry Postmeter talk about how he can interpret and do analysis of seismic and se seismic geomorphology. I've listened to um, Tim McCarg talk about sequence stratigraphy standing at the rocks in the Karoo Basin in South Africa. 
Morgan Sullivan and the Ross Formation, and, you know, and so on and on. I know the complexity of what we do. And this is what I know. The great innovations and value that's been added within our field is because of creativity. It's because of discovering new concepts. And no machine has ever done that. There's a perfect quote I have in one of my talks, in my, my lectures to executives, where it talks about the fact that the Higgs boson was discovered using a lot of data analytics and a lot of machine learning, a lot of you know, data science behind it to support it. But the actual discovery was not data driven. It was not based on those sciences. They support it. Mm. But the actual creativity to look for it, the actual development of the design, it didn't come from a machine. So that's what I believe. I believe that we'll still need, you know, geoscience and engineering will be core to everything we do. I want to ask a personal question in that light then. And that would be, and this gets us back to what the story you talked about when you were at the, at the filling up your car <laughs> yeah. in Canada, right? Yeah. Uh, and, I think there, there, there may be a connection with what you just said and that moment and this, this long arc you've been on, this journey is your creativity and your creative approach to life. Where, where do you go for inspiration and where does that creative drive come? So it's a very good question. Um, I feel I'm in my element when I'm working with my hands, okay. when I'm doing something difficult physically. And so um, I have kayaks. I actually have eight kayaks in my garage. Um, come to Austin, come kayaking with me. I take people kayaking every weekend. I tell my students or other faculty, I'll be eight o'clock in the morning Saturday, show up at my house, come kayaking. And I take people all the time. Um, when we do a really hard kayaking trip, when you have physical exertion, when you're paddling into the wind and the waves are battering against you, to me, that's beautiful. Yeah. And to me, that teaches me something. And it makes me appreciate something. Long hikes, climbing things, mountain biking things, doing things on my mountain bike I didn't think I could do. Yeah. You know, um, my wife and I, we do some weight training. I know I'm a skinny guy, but we still do a little bit to stay healthy and strong, keep our bones strong. Um, when you're lifting something heavier than you thought you could. Yeah. To me, that's, there's beauty in that. And so sometimes when I talk to my students, my graduate class, my very first graduate class was pretty small. It didn't sell out. I was a brand new professor. Nobody knew me that first fall, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, there was only six students in it. I took everyone kayaking. I, I love it. I love it. I think, I think that's, I think part of education and sharing is, uh, is sharing some of these things. I also do talk to students about work life balance. I talk to them mm -hmm. about how to succeed in industry. Those are other topics. But I do find that that's, um, and then of course, besides that, it's um, in those moments you pick up a guitar and just strum something and right. play away at something. It's just that, just the feeling of the vibration, hearing the music you create or attending music. Yeah, so there's last, much beauty. There's much beauty, and much you beauty. see much beauty. So let me. So this this ought to be an easy one to to end with, and that's looking forward. Yeah. And what possibilities do we still have? Um, it. Do you, have you tried to? Um, and you've said it yourself that everything is changing so quickly, and we're all learning together at the yeah. same time. So this may be difficult. On the other hand. You're a pretty optimistic person. What do you see going forward? What kind of expect? What kind of changes might we anticipate? Yeah, good question. Good question. I so there was a great talk given by my old PhD advisor um, on black boxes, and the comment was that black box use is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. How many people truly understand their cell phone? Because the cell phone, right, the technology behind the cell phone, none of us really understand it. Not many of us don't, but we use it and we make use of it and we're productive with it. The idea of the maturing of some of these technologies to the point where they become black box and extremely useful, that to me excites me. The idea of hu huge new ways that we can interface with data and with systems and understand and explore systems, new lenses to be able to see what's going on in the subsurface, that's exciting to me. I truly believe that this technology will just make it more and more exciting. It's a wonderful time to be a geoscientist. It's an amazing time to see this transition. I think we're going to like what we'll see. And I can't wait to be there with you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Michael, for being with us Thank today. You, Appreciate it. We've been talking today to Dr. Michael Perch, an associate professor in the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Be sure to check out his lecture at AEPG.org. Believe me, you won't be sorry. 
And watch this space for more AAPG podcasts that will cover a variety of important subjects and intriguing people, including our ongoing Digging Deeper series featuring conversations with this year's distinguished lecturers. All AAPG podcasts are available through the AAPG website or your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, whatever your preference, we're there. The Distinguished Lecture Program is a jointly operated program by AAPG and the AAPG Foundation. And as always, we hope you'll take a moment soon to check out the AAPG Foundation website to discover how you can be part of ensuring the future of geosciences. And for now, thanks for listening.